in 80 days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Verne's most famous work. Now, most visitors going to Egypt will enter via Cairo. And it makes sense. In Cairo, you have the, the Giza Plateau with the pyramids. You have the Sphinx. You have the incredible Egyptian Museum. You have the Nile um, and all of Cairo. It's, it's the obvious place to start. But if you want to get the true full extent of magical, mysterious Egypt, you also have to get outside of Cairo, because outside of Cairo, you will find remote desert monasteries, romantic coastal resorts where you can do incredible blue or deep water scuba diving in the Red Sea. You can see once drowned temples like Abu Simbel and millennia old masterpieces of, you know, one of the most, I guess, intriguing cultures that have ever been on planet Earth. Now, this is the story of the, the Grand Egypt Museum. Now, it was some 20 years in the making, and it cost billions of dollars to create. But the newest and biggest art museum on the planet has finally opened and it's a big deal and something I'm super excited about. It's the much vaunted debut for art museums of the world as, as it is for people who are interested in art and history with the grand opening of the Grand Egyptian Museum which opened in 2023 and it lays claim to being the biggest art museum in the world. So when your country is famous for show-stopping attractions that happen to be right next door, and they are the Great Pyramids of Giza, it follows that you're going to need a pretty spectacular museum that has the same ability to inspire awe and, fa and fascination. So the, the gem, as it is known, is an architectural miracle showcasing the finest examples of ancient Egypt and modern styles, which came from the second largest architectural competition the world has ever seen. Now, the story of that is that the Ministry of Tourism declared a mega competition, and they had 1,557 entries uh, from 82 different countries, and only 20 were selected to be finalists. The winning design, took the prize of $250,000 and it was won by the architects who are Rishin Hennigan and Shifu Peng. And if that's not a, a multicultural combination, I don't know what is. And their, their company is an Irish um, founded company called Hennigan Peng. So it was a real you know, United Nations effort to get this thing um, built and, and open. So the winning design includes a chamfered triangle which has an epic flat top and these marvelous sloping sides, reaching up to 65 meters, up to 50 meters. 
and yet the exterior is clad in a, in a limestone in order to mimic the same kinds of stones that the actual pyramids of Giza were actually you know, completed in. Um, and all the panels are made of laser-cut stone, limestone, and they carry these in incredible patterns resembling the, the traditional Egyptian motifs that include papyrus plant and the lotus flower. So when you see it from a distance, the sprawling postmodern gem, as it's called, is so huge that it's hard to make sense of. It's jutting, its prow lines resemble an enormous ship that has been you know, run aground in the desert. But then closer up, the museum's exterior is covered in these motifs that I was just saying, echoing the pyramids of Giza that rise a little more than just a mile away. So it's all kind of composed on the Giza Plateau, which is just 20 minutes from the very heart of Cairo. The design may be awe-inspiring and a little bit overwhelming, but the message is clear. This is a museum fit for a pharaoh. So the Grand Egyptian Museum is a highly vivid piece of art. It's made to resemble the giant ancient Egyptian pyramids and the temples found in Egypt. And while being a state-of-the-art facility exhibiting an ideal blend of modern and ancient styles, while protecting a trove of glorious treasures that each has its own story to tell, it was made to open a miraculous portal into the, one of the world's most fascinating and important periods of history. The brand new museum offers us different pockets of different dimensions filled with the greatest collection of artifacts and monuments ever made in the vast history of the world. And this heavenly wonder is able to shed light on the evolution of the ancient Egyptian civilization that happened over 7,000 years. The gem is a signature project, as you can imagine, of the Egyptian government. And it was a monumental undertaking beginning 20 years ago because of the Arab Spring uprisings and the COVID-19 pandemic, it was many years behind its scheduled release. In a nation which is dependent on tourism revenue and where archaeology and politics are deeply entwined, all of Egypt is backing the gem to ensure it is a resounding success. And you wonder, how, it, how could it not be? Now, the construction of the Grand Egyptian Museum started in 2002, when President Hosni Mubarak um, decided it was time for Egypt to have its own gigantic state-of-the-art museum. The dream started to take place when the foundation stone was laid the same year, and the statue of Ramses II was moved from Ramses Square in Cairo to the Giza Pyramids Plateau in 2006 and then to the GEM Atrium in 2018. A funding campaign um, began in 2007 to raise a billion dollars um, for the museum. And it took place by securing $300 million from the Japan Bank for international co cooperation, $147 million taken from the Egyptian government, and the rest was gathered from many international organizations and numerous private donations. The construction started in 2008 through earth moving and the entire tendering process was completed in 2013. The museum was completed in 2022 after a series of delays and the grand opening happened in 2023. Now, the, the opening of the Grand Egyptian Museum does not mean the closure of the previously famous Cairo or Egyptian Museum that I've been to before. In fact, both museums are still now open to the public. You have a choice of two or see the both of them. And they offer visitors an incredible experience and a different experience showcasing very different collections. The Cairo Museum is located in the heart of Cairo and is home to an extensive collection 
of Egyptian antiquities, including many famous artifacts from ancient Egypt. And among the highlights of the Cairo Museum are the treasures of King Tutankhamun, including his famous golden mask, as well as countless other artifacts from the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom periods. The gem, on the other hand, being a brand new museum um, constructed near the Giza pyramids, about 20 kilometers from downtown Cairo, is said to be the largest museum in the world, even bigger than the Louvre in Paris. And the gem, as well as its antiquities and relics, offers state-of-the-art technology and interactive exhibits designed to provide visitors with a very unique and immersive experience. And while the Cairo Museum will continue to be an important destination for visitors to Egypt, the gem is expected to become the new centerpiece of Egypt's cultural tourism industry. And the two museums will complement each other with the Cairo Museum being a more traditional museum experience and the gem providing um, a more modern and interactive experience. And together, they will offer visitors a comprehensive look at the fascinating history of Egypt's rich cultural um, past. Now, I've been there twice now, and I'm very blessed, I'm very lucky. The first time I went there, I don't even know what I was thinking. I'd been living in New York City, and I was heading my way back to Sydney, or Australia, after my traineeship um, in brand management and marketing had been completed, and I took the long way home, as I would always try and do, which meant going from New York to Europe, um, where I actually was in Rome and, and then went to the Greek islands for a little while to get some sun and, and uh, let off some steam in Mykonos, <clears throat> the fabulous, famous gay island. Not that I'm gay, but and not that I have anything against gays. They've actually created an incredible um, environment and make it really the, the special place that it is, along with the Greeks, obviously. And then I, I took a plane, I think it was an Egypt Air flight, or it might have been Olympic, you know, it was Olympic Airways, um, to Cairo. And the experience was quite an eye-opener. I got on the plane, you know, with my boarding pass, my ticket, um, started looking for my seat, and then I found there were all these people, you know, they would look like Arab people, um, with, you know, wraps on their heads, sitting in my seat and they wouldn't speak English and they weren't going to move. So, I'm, And literally nobody was getting on the plane to Cairo, at least all the, the Egyptian people or Arab, Arab people. It seemed like they didn't really know what the whole kind of order of <clears throat> getting on the plane was all about because they didn't care. They wouldn't sit down. They had animals with them. It was like a zoo. So that was kind of my first foreshadowing of what Egypt was going to be like. And. Uh, yeah, it, it definitely <laughs> it was a good foreshadowing experience. So going to Cairo, I think the first time, it's, it's an incredible place. Um, it's incredibly dusty, obviously because it's on the banks of the Nile and there's a lot of silt and everything from the river that blows in. Um, and you, you're in Africa, you're not in Europe anymore, you're in Africa. And in Africa, everything is different. Everything smells different. The heat, the feel, the humidity, it's incredible. Cairo is chaos. Um, and one of the first things I did, um, which you can do in Cairo, which is well worth, it's an unmissable event, which is to visit the Egyptian Museum.
Now, the Egyptian museum, I mean, the Louvre has incredible Egyptian um, relics and things. So does the Met in New York City. I mean, all of the, the British Museum, they all have Egyptology sections, but the epicenter, the grandest of the grand is obviously in Egypt. And the Egyptian Museum is the oldest archeological museum in the entire Middle East. And obviously it houses the largest collection of pharaonic antiquities in the world. And it's, ex it's an expansive collection. You know, it's pre-dynastic period, right up to the Greco-Roman period. Um, and the architecture of the building was also quite interesting. And it was selected th through an international competition in 1895, and, which was the first of its kind and won by a French architect, um, Marcel Dorion. And, and it was inaugurated in 1902 by Khedive Abbas Helmi II. And it's become a world, world landmark, um, especially. And it's right in the middle of downtown Cairo. You can't miss it. It's, it's almost like going back and seeing exactly what was back in you know, ancient times. Now, I was lucky um, when I went, you know, it, it was built at the turn of the 20th century and it, it's got apparently 120,000 priceless artifacts. It's the largest collection of pharaonic um, antiquities in the world. Um, you, you see these towering statues in, on the ground floor. Um, entire sections of stone relief. It's actually more, even more impressive than the Temple of Dendor, which is in the Met Museum in New York, which I would spend when I lived there, um, endless Sunday afternoons strolling around them. And I think it's probably the reason why I developed such a fascination for Egypt and read many, many books. And so by the time I got to Egypt and Cairo, I was already kind of a, an amateur Egyptologist and was really, really looking forward to actually exploring the fabled lands and, and you know, relics of the, the pharaohs. And of course, one of the most priceless things you'll see in the Egyptian Museum is the, is the face mask of King Tutankhamun, the boy king. Um, but there's mummies, there's coffins, there's bas-reliefs, um, there's ornaments, there's trinkets, there's money, there's, you know, it, they've got everything. Um, and it's quite remarkable how all that stuff actually stayed in Egypt. But the one thing that, I, that made my first trip so memorable is actually I, I came across, um, and you will get hassled in Egypt, in Cairo. There's a lot of beggars, there's a lot of people going, come with me to my bazaar, every two seconds, wherever you go. So be prepared to be hassled a lot. But serendipitously, I managed to bump into and meet a guide who, his name was Mustafa. And I spent three hours with Mustafa. I didn't know, you know, he said he was, you know, one of the, the museum's special, you know, orth author candid guards and he had, you know, a lanyard around his neck. But I had no idea how amazing he was. He was the guy who was the lead Egyptology expert that traveled the world with the, the, Tut the famous Tutankhamun exhibition the tour of the world for years and years and years. And he really knew his stuff. So with him, I was like looking through a portal into 3,000 years ago, in the, in the time of the pyramids, the building of the pyramids and the pharaohs. It was such a rich experience. I wish I had a camera and I was filming him because it would be in this, this video. He was an elderly guy, Mustafa, and he told me he spoke seven languages and if you go there, it's a really sacred, special experience and you really want to make the most of it. So I would recommend getting a guide, spend the whole afternoon there. I guarantee you will not be disappointed. It was one of the most memorable museum excursions I've had in my entire life. It was 20 years ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. And within the, the museum's collection, there's an unrivaled, you know, there's the complete burials of Yuya and Thuya, Pazans, the treasures of Tanis, the Nama palette commemorating unification of Upper and Lower Egypt um, under one king, um, 120,000 architects. And it has some splendid statues of the great kings Khufu, Khafre, Menkor, 
and the builders of the pyramids at the Giza Plateau. Uh, obviously, there's an extensive you know, collection of papyri, sarcophagi, jewelry, other objects. Um, it's an expansive experience. So when you're in Cairo, or when you're first in Egypt in Cairo, the first thing you have to do, <laughs> probably the, the most sensible and logical thing to do, is to plan a day going to the, the, the Giza Plateau, which is where the pyramids and the Sphinx are. And it's, it's jaw-dropping. I mean, you, I cannot explain it to you. You'll see it in the video that goes along with this. Just taking one thing, which is the, the grand, the, you know, the, the Pyramid of Cheops, or Chufu, was 41 metres tall. You know, it's taller than Big Ben in London. And seen up close, the magnitude and mass of these structures is incredibly jaw-dropping. It's humbling, you know. It's, um, it is thought that the Grand Pyramid took 20 years to build um, by 4,000 labourers to construct. And the cost of building the Cheops Pyramid alone today would, would easily equate to 5 billion US dollars. It's, it's, it's a never been, you know, repeated kind of marvel. Um, and entering inside the, the pyramids themselves, I can guarantee you, you know, I'm six foot four and 100 kilos. Um, it's very claustrophobic. So if you're really big and tall like me, you may want to think about it because it's, it's, very, it's a snug fit. You might feel like you never get out. The next thing is the El Zahar Mosque. And in Cairo, you know, rock the Casbah, drop your bombs between the minarets and all that. Cairo is a city, what's called the city of a thousand minarets, and the first to rise into the sky belonged here, part of the El Zahar Mosque. It's the city's oldest. It's also the second oldest continuously run university in the world, specialising in the study of Sunni theology and Sharia law. It's an architectural marvel resplendent with intricately dormant domes and courtyards. And again, if you can find a guide, it's the best way to experience it, to get come to grips with the history. Another thing you can do um, in and around Cairo, which I recommend totally, it's getting out on the Nile. You know, the Nile is mar a miraculous waterway, the second largest river in the entire world. And it, it runs through 11 African countries, to give you an idea how big that is. It's seemingly endless, and it was instrumental in the formation of the Egyptian civilization because the layers of silt that were carried downstream and deposited on the banks made the whole you know, river area of, um, a great place for growing crops. And crops such as wheat, which, which became trade goods, became a valuable export that helped the country become you know, rich. Um, they fed the Roman legions, apparently. Um, and the ancient Egyptians believed that the east represented birth, while the west, where the sun set, represented death and the afterlife. And it's why all the tombs were located west of the Nile. So whether you take a morning boat trip um, on one of its temples, to one of its temples, or a leisurely few days voyage on a felucca like I did. The, a felucca is a strange crescent-shaped sailed uh, sailing craft that I've only seen in Egypt. You can do that, or you can take a more Agatha Christie-esque luxury steamer um, and cruise down the Nile between Luxor and Aswan, which is all the way down near um, Somalia. A cruise on the Nile is a bucket list must-have. And speaking of Agatha Christie, in continuing on the theme that I, I did with the, you know, Murder on the Iron Express, um, the movie Death on the Nile, based on a story by Agatha Christie, is, is another movie that has popped up recently, again by Kenneth Branagh. And when Agatha Christie introduced Hercule Poirot 
in the mysterious affair of all at Styles in 1920, the brilliantly mustached detective has been a mainstay of whodunits on TV and film ever since. You know, it's almost over a century now he's been popping up. Christie wrote Poirot into 33 novels, two plays, and more than 50 short stories, meaning there's never been a shortage of material to actually you know, reinvent, adapt, and bring to the screen again. Um, and Poirot's latest, you know, Splash, again featuring Kenneth Branagh, um, is the sequel to the 2017 uh, Murder on the Orient Express that you may have or may not have seen. And it mimics many of the same beats of Christie's 1937 book, um, right down to Karnak. And it's, I always find it interesting when they do these historical remakes of movies, the... Um, the film sequences of the sets, and I don't think it was done um, in CGI or anything, I think it was all practically shot in and around Egypt. Um, because, I mean, where do you get light like that? Where do you get, you know, monuments like that? It's, it's almost impossible. But the plot actually takes place on the Nile, on the steamer, where the guests, similarly to the locomotive uh, plot line, can't leave, which gives Hercule Poirot the opportunity to probe and uh, discover the, uh, the lies and uh, motive, motives. And whilst the, the death on the Nile has, has been a drama behind the camera, um, almost a quarter of its marquee staff are also involved in, in um, dramas and controversy at least one, one time since. I mean, Arnie Harmer, I don't know if you know him, was spectacularly and rightfully who fell from grace in 2021 with his his outed fetishes of, you know, sexual cannibalism and the like, which is kind of hard to come back with, plus all these weird text messages, um, how he was cheating on his wife with multiple women and um, had definitely some uh, unsavoury kind of personal tastes in fetish and um, what he did to women. Maybe it should have been called Death on the Nile, Drama on the Set. Now, going outside of Cairo, which is a must-do, one thing I guarantee you must do when you go to Egypt is the Valley of the Kings. It's where all the major you know, tombs and everything were actually discovered. And it's probably the most... It's Indiana Jones's you know, setting, everything, and it's probably the most evocative Egyptian site you'll see because all of the lore of undiscovered tombs piled with riches and mummies, curses and tomb raiders, it all happened there. That's where they found the tomb of Tutankhamun in the 1920s, and it's still a site of ongoing excavations, um, exploration and conservation for our archaeologists. So you can get to Luxor by the Nile on a boat, or you can go by road. I think you can even fly too. And it's, it's a place of scorched earth, you're in the Sahara Desert, and you'll feel a million miles from any kind of civilization there. And it's, it's crazy when you swallow the hole as you descend into the preserved tombs and the decorative reliefs. It, almost, you know, back in time, bright and like, like nothing had been touched. And then there's Abu Simbel, which is another amazing monument. And it sits on the banks of Lake Nasser, and it's one of easily one of Egypt's most striking monuments. I mean, it's on a par with the pyramids. The twin temples of Abu Simbel were, were built by Ramses II over 3,000 years ago. And to say they've stood the test of time is an understatement. It, it's even more fascinating when you learn that they actually moved the temple. That's right, they pulled it down block by block, then removed it because of the, the Aswan Dam construction where it would have been underwater. Now, Abu Simbel is 300 kilometers south of Aswan, just 20 kilometers north of the Sudan border. And it sits on the western bank of Lake Nasa in a region called Nubia. You know, Nubia is a large region along the Nile, it spans southern Egypt and northern Sudan. 
where the Nubians came from. The great temple of Abu Simbel is dedicated to the god Amon Ra, and you would have seen him in all those mummy movies, Ra, Hakati, and Ptah. And it was erected to demonstrate the might of the Egyptian empire and the eternal godlike glorification of Ramses II. The two temples took 20 years to build and were completed in 1244 BC. And over time, the temples were forgotten and slowly covered with sand. And it was in 1813 that John Louis Burkhardt rediscovered the temple. Um, he rediscovered its entrance and finding the top frieze of the great temple. Um, four years later, Giovanni Battista Belzoni managed to remove some of the sand and actually find the entrance into the temple. But when the sand was cleared away, it became a great tourist attraction, attracting visitors even to the end of the 19th century. But with the construction of the High Aswan Dam, the rising water levels to flood the temple, threatened to flood the temples of Abu Simbel. So in the 1960s, the entire temple complex was dismantled and moved to higher ground. It took the combined effort of over 50 countries and five years of work to save the temples. When you stand in front of the temple and when you go inside it, it's hard to imagine that the complex was, was actually in a different location and it was moved. Another must visit is the Luxor Temple, which is in obviously Luxor. And this usual temple differs from most archaeological sites in Luxor, is that it wasn't dedicated to one single pharaoh or one single god. It was built as a ceremonial temple for the crowning of, of cut that out, the crowning of all Egyptian rulers. And it's a showstopper. It's an avenue of human-headed sphinxes leading up to the entrance where two broad sandstone towers stand sentinel, decorated with carved hieroglyphics and battle scenes. They usher you in, and inside you'll find towering statues of gods, endless columns and colonnades, and the intriguing remnants of the internal structures such as the chapels. And then there's the Temple of Karnak. Karnak is the second most visited city or site in all of Egypt after the pyramids of Giza. And it's not hard to see why. It's absolutely epic, covering an area the size of a village. And in fact, the name Karnak is derived from the Arabic Kurnak, meaning fortified village. And at one stage, it was connected to the Temple of Luxor by a 2.5-kilometre um, avenue of Sphinx statues, and some of them are still intact. It's also unique in that it's been constructed over two, million, two millennia. Some of the gods represented in the later sections wouldn't have been recognised by those who were building the earlier sections. Then there's Sham El Sheik, or Nama Bay. And if you thought going to Egypt was going to be all sand and dust and temples and rocks, you would be wrong because it actually sits on the coast of the Red Sea, which has become a really glamorous, fashionable, high-end tourist destination um, in a number of variety of spots. And Sharm El Sheikh is one of the, the top ones. Um, there's palm trees, and it's one of the best beaches in all of Egypt. Golden sand, clear waters, um, lots of sun, and amazingly crystal clear Red Sea water, which I actually scuba dived in at Hergada when I was there. Um, and it's chock full of marine life. It's, it's extraordinary. And then there is the Temple of Philae. And it seems unthinkable now that you, you know, we could be so reckless to knowingly flood an Egyptian Roman buildings, especially those with such incredibly historically important artwork. But that's exactly what happened when at the 19th, turn of the 19th century, the Aswan Low Dam was built, raising the water level of Lake Nasser and it submerged the island of Philae with its ancient temple complex. In the 1960s, um, after more than a century of water damage, it was decided to move the entire temple complex brick by brick to the higher nearby island of Al Gilkia, where it stands today. 
and it's definitely worth seeing. And then you have the um, coastal resort of Hergada, which is a place that I went to when I first went to Egypt to do some scuba diving, which was one of my passions um, at that particular time. Um, and Hergada on the Red Sea was, was one of the, the top legendary dive sites for avid um, scuba divers with incredible deep walls, um, you know, gr incredible visibility and spectacular marine life. And I remember that quite vividly. In fact, um, Hergada and the resorts around there, they even have grand aquariums. And, and again, it's another one of these incredible tourist destinations where you can stay on a you know, beach resort kind of thing. But back then, it was such you know, a little outpost and it was so underdeveloped. I took a little light airplane to get down there and I remember flying at nighttime and they didn't even have an airport. They just, they had some lanterns that were physically put down to create a kind of landing strip and the little light plane followed the, the lanterns to land. And you get out and you're in the, you know, the desert uh, with a few little huts and stuff there. Um, and it's really come a long way. You know, there's now, now a massive tourist infrastructure there and even um, quite a, a remarkable world-class you know, aquarium, which is um, well worth a visit on its own. And then if you're going down to Abu Simbel, it will pay you to actually visit the Aswan High Dam too, the, uh, the water structure of the Nile that actually caused Abu Simbel to um, <laughs> be submerged or moved. Um, and it's massive. It's 364 feet tall and 4,000 meters wide. And it's the largest embankment dam in the world. Um, and it's holding back the waters of the mighty Nile. And it was obviously a big, big part of irrigation and um, over protection from over flooding, which was threatening to cause famine throughout Egypt. And the dam changed everything by allowing more continuity, consistency and efficiency with the way the water was released. Another great thing outside of Cairo is the Temple of Hatshepsut. And this is another massive, it's, you know, it merges from these towering jagged cliffs at Deir El Bahari. The temple has a crispness and a symmetry to it that belies its antiquity. You know, it's kind of like the Pantheon. You kind of wonder how these ancient builders came up with such an incredibly beautiful marvel. Um, and it's built 3,000 years ago. And in the intervening period, the temple was reduced to rubble by you know, weather, earthquakes, and deliberate destruction. But it's been brought back to life by a Polish Egyptian team of archeologists and conservationists. I mean, how could you let some of the marvels of Egypt? You know, we, in our little fragile world, we don't have that many things to be precious about in, in, in the infinite space of the cosmos. These, these little treasures, you know, regardless of time and progress and money, we have to protect and preserve them because if we don't remember the history of where we came from, what's the point of going anywhere? And then lastly, I'll say <laughs> the desert itself, or probably better still, the Eastern Desert is something that you really need to experience. And this scorching expanse, sandwiched between the Nile to the west and the Red Sea Mountains to the east, it's both a massive outdoor playground and an open-air museum, full of archaeological sites. It may be where they filmed the John Wick movie, where he's walking up the sand dunes. But in the Sahara, there are sand dunes for gazillions of miles. And if you want to explore it, which you should, I would suggest you take an official tour because you don't want to get lost out there or compromised because you will die. So, because there's no roads and accessible to tourists anyway. So unless you've got, you know, your own helicopter, you won't be able to get in there. And you want to, you know, experience the, the great sites like the Monastery of St. Paul, the Anchorite, Wadi Hamamat, the ancient mining and trading route, 
and it's littered with rock carvings and graffiti. And in between, you can do your adventure adrenaline rush stuff and get on a quad bike and blast through the sand dunes and um, be careful you don't tip because those things flip over really easily. And that's the end.